So um, this research was funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency um, through an award with the Puget Sound Partnership. The project was developed in response to issues raised by regional experts involved in the Puget Sound Partnership's marine water quality implementation strategy. Um, what this implementation strategy was about is how, as a region, we can work together to meet water quality goals related to dissolved oxygen and nutrients in Puget Sound. And so we wanted to see if affordability challenges for local utilities were an isolated concern for a couple of um, specific utilities or if it was a larger structural regional issue because how you would respond to those two cases would be very different. Take you through our methods. Um, we had um, eight d data compilation and analysis steps. Assumed a standardized volume per household so that we can normalize our service costs across the region. Here's the range of household incomes that we have in Puget Sound. 80 utilities. This is the range of the estimated monthly charges for each one of those 80 utilities. The, the lowest monthly bill is in the neighborhood of $30. So you can look at the little orange bar at the bottom. And then way up at the top, the you know, somebody else is paying 100, some other Puget Sound resident is paying $160 per month. All right, so we've got a big range in um, utility rates, big range in household income. And so the percent median household income is a measure um, used by EPA to look at finan financial capability of a utility to implement new um, water quality controls. And lowest quintile income measure um, captures the effect on household, households and specifically low income households. Out here, there's no universal definition of affordability. It's a little bit of a moving target. Above 2% MHI at the utility level, you get a little bit nervous um, about being able to recover costs. And at 2%, above 2% LQI, you start to really worry about those households. What percent of the household income goes to pay those sewer costs? Now, the story is much different when you look at the lowest quintile income. This is where, you know, these are the equity issues that we're concerned about. This is the regressive nature of the tax policy in Washington state. How much are we burdening our low income households? For the most part, 20% of the households in the Puget Sound that are served by a sewer utility that are low income are exceeding this 2%. And some of them are all, they're all the way up to 10%. The Bureau of Economic Analysis has stated that on average, and this is a national average again, people spend about 10% of their income on food. Now, there's two things to take away from that. One is we're burdening low income families. The second thing is it's difficult for utilities to feel like they could count on their revenue streams coming in when they know that 20% of the households are in this low income and may be severely burdened in terms of being able to pay their bills, right? Because the utility needs them to pay them, pay the bill just to be fiscally solvent. Um, and then what we did to project future costs was we used a report prepared by Ecology and Tetra Tech in 2011 that looked at how much it would cost to add nutrient controls to wastewater treatment plants in the region. And so what we did, we were able to escalate those to $20, $22. Provided four different scenarios. We took the lowest scenario and the highest scenario. And this is because Ecology hasn't decided on specific effluent limits that are gonna be needed to meet um, water quality standards. We took current rates and the nutrient adjustments. That's all we did. We add that extra estimate of what the sewer rates are gonna to escalate to just to pay for the nutrient upgrades. We get many more utilities in the Puget Sound that are now charging above 2% of, of, of median income to their rate payers. So the households that are in the lowest 20% are facing more than 2% of their household budget goes to pay for sewer, just for sewer services. And on the high end, it's up to almost 13.5%. This is an indication of we maybe need to look at state or federal money. There are assistance programs for people who are disabled mm -hmm. and on fixed income. There are almost no assistance. Should we consider the feasibility of a state or a region-wide low-income assistance program 
that's designed to reduce the administrative burdens. This work, we're talking very specifically about nutrient reduction upgrades at wastewater treatment plants. And so again, this is another case. Our, um, our results, just to contextualize, are probably conservatively low. Discussions with other utilities, it does seem that also these estimates are probably a little bit on the low side compared to some of the newer estimates. As you heard, their affordability analysis was based on escalating numbers from Ecology from a 2011 report um, of which the total cost for all of the treatment plant upgrades was around two to $5 billion. Uh, to put it in perspective, um, it's understood based on their study that those numbers are underestimated for the actual impacts to utilities across the Puget Sound. And for example, environmental services, we have updated our existing numbers to upgrade our tr two treatment plants, which would total $2 billion. The county has also recently updated their numbers, and they are looking at over $25 billion to upgrade their treatment facilities. We probably have planned increases in rates for other reasons as well. Those are not factored in. We've got a lot of escalating costs driven by new regulatory requirements um, for you know, new stormwater structural retrofits in the next permit. We have PFAS and drinking water. Their infrastructure bill allotment to EPA for water quality, I think was only, only um, $11 billion, right? So even that historic federal